Well, now you probably know more about vomiting than you really wanted to, right? But it could come in handy. Let's talk uh, a little bit of a, a side trip uh, from our path of fluid through the digestive tract. And let's talk a little bit about these organs that are considered accessory organs to digestion. The liver and the gallbladder, we'll be grouping those together, and then the pancreas. Now they're all right there in a similar area. And here's one important thing. The liver, the gallbladder, and the pancreas, what they add to your digestive tract gets added at the beginning of the duodenum, well, pretty close to the beginning of the duodenum. Um, one of the very important roles that the duodenum, duodenum, tomato, tomato, um, one of the very important things about that small section of the small intestine is that so many things get mixed together there. We're going to get the chyme that came out of the stomach, highly acidic. We're going to get bicarbonate from the duodenum itself. We're going to get bile that's going to come from the liver or the gallbladder. And then we're going to have all kinds of pancreatic enzymes that get added. A lot happens there. In addition, the duodenum, when it receives that chyme from the stomach, particularly chyme mixed with fat, that'll trigger the duodenum to release hormones. Very important area. So these are accessory organs, but they're important for digestion. Let's, let's talk first about um, just a reminder about the path of blood flow. You should have learned this in 150. It was very important that the liver is an unusual organ because it gets blood coming into it from two entirely different sources. Blood enters the uh, inferior aspect of the liver through two different blood vessels that are kind of right side by side. One of them carries red, highly oxygenated blood that very recently came from the heart. And that is in a blood vessel called the proper hepatic artery. The proper hepatic artery is bringing blood that are going to go into these capillary beds and deliver oxygen to all these very hardworking cells of the liver. But right next to it, running parallel to it at every point, is this blood vessel, the hepatic portal vein. Very important and also on the final exam. The hepatic portal vein is also delivering blood to the same capillary beds, meaning the highly oxygenated red blood is going to be mixed with this blood from the hepatic portal as it travels through the capillary beds. What is blood from the hepatic portal vein? What is it bringing? It is bringing blood that it just gathered from all of the villi of the intestines. Um, when you absorb um, uh, nutrients from whatever it is that you ate, the carbohydrates and the amino acids are going to be placed into the capillary bed at the villus, and that capillary Bed, all of those villi capillary beds are going to gather up all of their blood and put it into this blood vessel, the hepatic portal vein, and that's going to go into the liver, giving the liver first dibs on any amino acid or sugar molecule that you just absorbed from your meal. Whatever the liver doesn't want to use, at least not at that moment, will get gathered up and all of the blood leaving the liver leaves through the hepatic veins. That used to confuse the heck out of me, that hepatic portal veins are not at all similar to hepatic veins, but now you know. We will be talking about that a little bit more, but when I'm telling you to follow every nutrient from where it's absorbed and gets digested to the heart, this is part of what I mean, that all of the uh, starches get broken down into monosaccharides. They get put into this bloodstream, which goes through the hepatic portal vein and through the liver and then back through the hepatic veins and back to the heart. Uh, amino acids, same deal. However, the triglycerides that get digested and absorbed, they will get packaged in this special form that we'll talk about, and they get put into a lacteal. The lacteal is the beginning of a lymphatic vessel and that bypasses the liver 
and gets thrown into the blood up here at the left subclavian vein, right? So a little bit more. Now, this is what the capillary bed of the liver looks like. The capillary beds of the liver are so unusual looking that they are actually called sinusoids instead of being called capillary beds, okay? But it's a capillary bed. The sinusoids, so do you see this red blood vessel here? That's a little tiny branchlet off of the proper hepatic artery bringing oxygenated blood. Do you see this little tiny blue blood vessel there? That's a little tiny branch of the hepatic portal vein bringing blood that's full of nutrient from the intestinal tract. And if you watch here, do you see how right there you get both of them mixing together and the blood that goes through the sinusoids is a mixture of lots of oxygen and not much oxygen. It's a mixture of both. These cells are called hepatocytes, which sounds specific, but it just means liver cells, albeit in medical terminology. These cells are busy using up the amino acids, using up the sugars, measuring things. And one of the things that they're doing is they are um, <clears throat> getting rid of hemoglobin um, turning the heme part of it into bilirubin. And bilirubin and bile salts are being made by these cells. And the bilirubin and the bile salt is being moved this way, the opposite direction. And it's going to come out here and get put into little microscopically small bile ductules. At, at each corner of these cords in the liver, <clears throat> you will find a branch of the proper hepatic artery, a branch of the portal vein and a branch uh, of the bile duct, which is like a little tiny branch at this point. Fascinating. All right. So the hepatic portal vein and the he hepatic artery bring blood to the liver. These are branches of those. The blood's going to go through these cords in the liver, get dropped into the central vein. That blood now is going to be leaving the liver and ultimately it'll be gathered up and leave the liver through the hepatic veins. The bile duct is going to collect bile from all these little ductules and canaliculi. All right, so we don't see any of those blood vessels on here. Um, here we see the general anatomy of this part of the digestive tract. I want you to notice that the stomach has been cut away and most of the intestinal tract has been cut away and everything's kind of been whoop, pulled apart just so we can see things a little more clearly. Everything's really scrunched in there. This line right here, whoop, that is the line of our diaphragm, right? The diaphragm is the most important muscle of respiration. In humans, the right lobe of the liver is much larger than the left lobe and even the left lobe is bigger than the quadrate and caudate. Your stomach would mostly be sitting over here on the left side of your body when it comes to the liver. Uh, uh, chyme, that is what your food is when it leaves the stomach, is getting dumped here into the duodenum. Uh, bicarbonate and enzymes from the pancreas are getting dumped in here. The duodenum itself is going to be putting in uh, bicarbonate to change the pH that's inside of here from that crazy acid stuff that got dunked in there. And then the liver is sending in bile. Whatever bile doesn't go straight into the duodenum from the liver, backs up, goes here into the gallbladder. The gallbladder is gonna store that bile, take the water out of it, turning it into a gel-like super concentrated bile. And then if you've got a fatty meal, uh, the duodenum signals to the gallbladder, hey, give a squeeze of that good concentrated bile in here and you'll get an extra squeeze also into the duodenum. The gallbladder and bile. The liver makes the bile. Bile is a mixture of things. The two parts of bile that we're going to talk about are bilirubin and bile acid, also called bile salts. Bilirubin. Bilirubin is something that the body is throwing away. Bilirubin is the molecule that got made from heme, that dangerous part of the hemoglobin, and now it's been turned into bilirubin, and bilirubin gets thrown into the intestinal tract. You know, the story of bilirubin, it's just trash, right? We're just throwing it away. It doesn't, 
Bilirubin does not help you digest anything, all right? But bilirubin is what makes bile green. Bilirubin's breakdown products is what makes poop brown. In the absence of bilirubin, a patient's poop looks gray. If you ever hear of anyone that has gray poop instead of brown poop, that is not an, oh, that's weird. No, that's a serious thing, okay? Because it means that there's an obstruction between the liver and the duodenum. Very often it's gonna be cancer, okay? Bilirubin is also, ends up being the reason that urine is yellow when urine is yellow. That and um, B vitamins, okay? So we're not gonna talk anymore about bilirubin. It's just trash. It's what makes things green and brown and yellow, um, but mm, doesn't do anything. This does. Bile acid, which are also known as bile salts. The difference between the bile acids and the bile salts is a, is a chemical distinction that we're biologists and we don't care so much. What do they do? They emulsify fats. Emulsify fats. The word emulsify does not mean to digest, all right? The bile acids and bile itself contains no enzymes, none. So then what is this emulsification and how does it help your body digest um, fats? Well, um, it's probably not obvious to you. I don't think it ever was to me, but proteins are meant to be suspended in water. Proteins dissolve in water by and large, and generally proteins do not dissolve in fat. That means that inside of this watery stuff that is whatever it is that you ate, plus all the juices that got added, in this watery stuff, the little globules of fat are looking like this. They're big globs of fat. You know, you know if you were doing dishes in a sink full of soapy water, that the fat tends to rest on the top. Oil and water don't mix. Fat and water don't mix. So even inside of what you have eaten, that fat is sticking to itself as, as big bubbles of fat, right? But the problem is that the proteins cannot dissolve into the bubble of fat. They are forced to work just <clears throat> at the outside. So we really need help with that. Let me give you an analogy. Let's imagine you were still in one of those auditoriums that we used to sit in back in the day. And I said, I have got this little bubble of fat right here. Each one of you is going to be an enzyme, a pancreatic lipase. And you're supposed to uh, digest this fat. And if you can do it within 15 minutes, yeah, everyone gets extra credit points, all right? But the problem is that there are, in that auditorium, 60 of you, you can't crowd around this one little bubble of fat. So certainly one of you is gonna say, hey, let's just divide that up into 60 pieces and give each of us one piece, we'll get it done faster, and you would. Taking this big ball of fat, dividing it up into tiny little pieces is what bile acids do, bile salts do, when they emulsify the fat. So instead of one ball of fat, we've got a million tiny little ones. Each one of them is surrounded by proteins that are busy um, uh, digesting the triglycerides that are in them. So the, the bile salts, bile acids that are inside of bile, they are important for digesting fat, not because they contain enzymes, they do not, but because bile acids, bile salts emulsify the fats that allow the enzymes to get to the fat. What happens if there's no bile? What happens if the amount of fat that you ate is much greater than the amount of bile that you had? Then some of those triglycerides will make it out that ileocecal valve without being digested, and then you are feeding them to the bacteria, and that generally will cause an upset stomach and very often diarrhea, right? We will start there at the beginning of our next video.